I can see the screen. Thank you. It, it's a very, thank you, Dr. Preston. I mean, you made the job easier for me actually to talk about uh, this topic on resistance management. That's a very nice introduction. And I took the liberty to answer a few questions. So uh, you please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, having said that, uh, uh, resistance management is a very broad topic. And when you look at Falarmivong, it's, it's even more bigger. And, and we all talk about it a whole lot, but what we can do at the ground level is, is practically implementable at the farm level. That's what we need to look at when we really have to take some of these tools from the toolbox. Having said that, uh, uh, what I would like to do in this presentation is take through few of the IRAC recommended guidelines and how we as industry uh, kind of work uh, to support this follow me on management in, in any geography and with more specificities towards uh, Asia and ASEAN region. So uh, there, are, there are lots of products, insecticide products, and few BT technologies, which uh, Dr. Preston already kind of mentioned about, uh, that are available in ASEAN. In fact, ASEAN region is the only region where BT con as on date is grown uh, as a product, uh, approved product. Of course, China recently coming in with its approved events. So just to focus more on ASEAN, uh, these are some of the insecticide modes of action that are available in ASEAN. There, there could be many which are used, but what, what we recognize that that have some sort of efficacy are, are these modes of action. And, and modes of action that I'm talking about, you know, the group numbers that are mentioned in the left side uh, column, and, and these are all very important for us to understand at the farm level when you implement them. So the mode of action labeling is one of the primary activity of IRAC and crop life uh, uh, in the stewardship perspective. Having, having mentioned about this mode of action, there are very few modes of action which are actually providing uh, very good efficacy against Falarmion. And, and you can see in the right-hand side, rightmost column, how the performance rating of some of these modes of action is, is happening at the ground level. And this is, this is just a qualitative indication uh, it does not indicate any individual product or individual, uh, you know, brand that's available there. And, and it's a general qualitative assessment that uh, the, the spinosines, uh, the insecticides of ivermectin group and diamides are the most efficacious uh, insecticides or modes of action available for us in ASEAN today to manage the pest. Besides them, we also have few BT technologies that are cultivated. Uh, Dr. Prasanna gave a list of them, uh, which are approved uh, in, in uh, Asian context or ASEAN context. However, as on date, there are only two, two three sets of technology, three technologies that are widely grown. Um, and, and those are, a couple of technologies are based on Kriven AB gene. And there are two stack products uh, sold with two, uh, Two or more genes, and one of them is Kriven 105 and Kriven 2 AB2 based products, and and the second one is Kriven AB plus Kriven F based products. So just to let you know that there are there are three different uh, you know technologies uh, that are available for control of Falarmivon when you look at the BT products. Okay. For the next couple of slides, I'll briefly explain to you how insects develop or for on kind of insects develop resistance to insecticides. You may have seen this slide, but just a refresher to you that when you keep spraying the same insecticide, when I'm saying same insecticide, insecticide belonging to the same mode of action, continuously, that's when insects become less sensitive and they start surviving to these sprays. So when I'm when I'm talking about this, say you take, for example, a one mode of action uh, from the previous slide that I was discussing, and you keep on spraying the same mode of action again and again and again, you see this, these yellow individuals, which are these reddish color individuals, which are naturally present and, and in the environment. 
they start increasing in the numbers as we progress and come here. So the yellows and reds start increasing. And this is actually the shifts that happen. And, and this is exactly what we will be monitoring when we conduct a resistance management plan in a country. So resistance monitoring identifies these individuals to some extent when we really uh, uh, conduct studies in a region. Alternatively, the best practice would be that you alternate these, these applications of the one mode of action with a different kind of mode of action, which would render more protection to the crop, meaning that the insects that in, in general would survive the one mode of action would not survive the second mode of action and the number of individuals that would be going to the next generation would be lower as against when they're using only single mode of action. So this way, the pest control options would be more sustainable. Let me explain to you with a, a kind of a calendar-based or a window-based approach that IRAC recommends. So when you look at the corn crop as such, when you divide the corn crop into different windows of 30 days, you will have a first window, second window, third window, possibly a fourth window. Okay, so pictorially, when you're looking at here, when I'm saying a window, it is equal to 30 days, which actually represents the time period for an insect to go through one generation. It may not be as precise or it may not be so perfect. There may be overlapping generations, but the window in general is an arbitrary 30 days that is set. So when a farmer goes into the field and sprays one insecticide from one mode of action on the first day of the first window, you, he, should be, he or she should be able to apply insecticide with a different MOA in a sequential window, that is in the second window. So when you look at the representation at the bottom most panel, the strongly recommended IRAC uh, mode of application is that you spray one insect set for mode of action one in the first window, mode of action two in the second window, and if possible, mode of action three in the third window. But you cannot keep on spraying mode of action one every single time you enter into the field. Okay, this is very important. We have been talking about it time and again everywhere, but the, the sense of it is very difficult when you go to the practical uh, application, you know, scenarios in the field level. So don't worry about overlapping generations. Don't worry about how many insects are there. If there, is, if there is a sense that you need to spray and you think that that is a recommended threshold in your country, go for the first spray. Scouting and monitoring helps us to do that, which I'll be discussing in the next slides. Okay. So IRAC has guidelines that were developed a long time ago in 2016 or 18. I, I always I'll kind of forget. And what we did is that uh, IRAC International Lepidopteran Working Group built upon this and, and they came up with a new guidelines that would really help us drive, uh, you know, at the farm level in Asia and Africa uh, to manage fallar mirror. So it is done in three steps. One, incorporate the agronomic actions, which I'll be showing you, identify the pest and decide when to treat it. There are still issues with right identification of the pest in spite of us talking about many identifying marks. So it's a refresher and a kind of a reminder to us that please identify the pest. Don't just jump in and start spraying it. And finally, you control the insect using IRM principles. So when I said incorporate agronomic actions, uh, I think uh, Dr. Prasanna touched based earlier on about IPM uh, practices. All cultural practices that you follow in a field will help dilute any kind of surviving insects that would affect the crop, not just during the current season, but also in the following seasons. Okay, so the step one is to keep in mind of this, you know, agronomic actions you could do. Before planting, remove all the volunteers and cover crops. You plant early with the first rains. You start scat you know, scattering these planting dates in a region. You are giving a very good crop continuum to the insect to survive. So try to avoid that. If possible, get into a community approach in a village or a small city or a province 
and start growing or planting this crop at the same time. Most importantly, destroy the infested plant parts and crop residues. These will have a lot of resting stages or larvae sitting in there, which would be waiting to move to the next crop when it comes up. And above all, although it's easy to say control weeds, if you have a weed control options, please use them. We have seen fallow mealworm surviving on weeds many places across the globe. So a good weed management and a clean field will help you reduce these carryover populations. Identifying pests, we have spoken about it. Please try to identify the pest properly. Look, do scouting regularly once the crop emerges. Zero to 45 days is very, very, very important time for us to do the scouting and monitoring and follow the recommended practices, whether it is IPM toolbox, from the IPM toolbox, which is including insecticides and biopesticides or biocontrol agents, whatever is available in the country. As I mentioned, you need to follow the IRM principles. I, I quickly uh, addressed upon earlier how modes of action needs to be rotated. Beyond this, you also need to remember very carefully that use those insecticides that are recommended. Do not go for off-label use and illegal products, which in fact may not provide the necessary control. And so this highlights the fact that the IRM principles and IPM principles go hand in hand and everything done under IPM will help in resistance management. Having said all of this, how do you how do you see the success of these practices? And one of the good ways is to monitor the resistance development of pest while using all the tools in an IPM toolbox. And this is done with an effective resistance monitoring program, which this project is going to be focusing on uh, in many, many countries in ASEAN. When you look at the insect resistance management using BT technologies, I already mentioned that there are three uh, uh, products based on three technologies available in ASEAN. One of the most important thing is the effective dose and use of a refuge. I think Dr. Prasanna already addressed about it. Uh, the key would be to use two or more mechanisms of action, which provides better control. I think entire industry is working very hard to address and bring products with two or more mechanisms of action or modes of action, you call it. It's very important that to know that industry is working towards this and we already have products in hand which are grown in ASEAN. Um, we also need to do resistance monitoring which is being done in the cultivating countries either at field level as a, as a performance monitoring or at the lab level. Uh, industry also works together and does a lot of regulatory outreach in terms of refining these plants and conducting uh, com compliance surveys when the products are sold. And most importantly, we always work towards bringing new generation technologies into ASEAN. And, and, and I believe each of the industry has its own new products in the pipeline. In spite of doing all of this, the key here is to have appropriate hybrids. I earlier was addressing a question uh, from Dr. Siva that whether we can use susceptible lines. Of course, susceptible lines are key for refuge, but it is just that agronomically, they should be equal to the BT hybrids or BT varieties that come into the space because that provides that agronomical synchrony for pests to develop and provide uh, a right refuge or effective refuge in the environment. Most important, I really want to harp on this for the next few seconds that for Follow me on management. We 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 should consider a holistic, multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, we have been talking about IPM toolbox continuously, but we also should be basing it upon clear, evidence-based advice to farmers. Many many farmers in ASEAN, except in the countries in Philippines and Vietnam, do not even know how some of the products work. And I think it is time that these products are enabled for. Uh, you know, these farmers to be, uh, you know, kind of visit and see with their own eyes how it's working and make a decision on whether they want certain products in their country or not. Uh, specifically to highlight here, a country like Indonesia, which has the largest corn growing, you know, area acreages, 
I think it's very important that we see that some of these BT technologies, which are already proven, are, are, are uh, you know, kind of enabled for farmers to see their uh, performance in Indonesia. Uh, access to technology, this again goes back to my uh, evidence-based, uh, you know, provisions to farmers uh, that regulatory system should be able to enable this access to technologies, to products and technologies uh, in, in countries where uh, it, it, they need it. Most importantly, the stakeholder coordination. I believe, I strongly believe that this project and, and ASEAN action plan will provide a very good platform for the stakeholder coordination. I think stakeholder coordination was very important earlier in North America and in South America, and it's going to play a major, major role in managing this pest. We somehow need to learn how to live with it now. That's following on. So we might as well come together and join hands to uh, build a strong multi-stakeholder approach for managing this insect. These are a few of the key takeaways that I thought I would leave it here. And, 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 and although I didn't touch base upon scouting, uh, it's, it's very important as part of IPM to do scouting. When you have a product or a technology planted in the field, doesn't mean that you, know, you encourage farmer to sit and, 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 and not bother about the crop. No, scouting is very important. And I, with that, I just want to stop here. And Great, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you yeah. so much. That was very good. Um, excellent, lots of information there. And I've got lots of questions coming in. We'll have to be quite quick. We're a bit tight on time, but that's okay yeah. because I'm going to be rapid fire here, Srinivas. You're going to be answering them. Uh, okay, you know. I'm done. I'm prepared. <laughs> like, a, like a game show. No, um, seriously, um, are there, now, we, we had this before, and this was mentioned actually in the previous presentation, but I think this would be a good introduction to the questions. Are there any BT corn, single gene as well as stacked, reported to have become resistant to fall armyworm? It's uh, the BT single genes that are actually that report of resistance or is in uh, South America and Puerto Rico, and it's to the Cryven AB and Cryven uh, F and Cryven A105, which actually was impacted due to the single gene resistance. Okay. And it's mostly in South America. Yeah. And, and so I think you mentioned this, but you have, and I think Prasanna also mentioned it around these, you know, single gene events. They are used, that BT corn, in the Philippines. And I think there was an example in Vietnam as well. Is that right? And if so, I think also Prasanna said that it's quite important to introduce maize pyramids producing two or more toxins that are each highly effective against fall armyworm. I mean, is that, would that be your sort of comment? I mean, given that you have resistance that has already uh, turned up in South America with those single events, is it important to move away from those and move to stacked or pyramid hybrids? I, I kind of agree with that, and I think that's that's what I mentioned. That industry is working towards bringing these uh, stacked hybrids into the uh, countries, cultivating countries, and and that's the need of the arm. Yeah. Okay. And 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 just to high, just to kind of mention there, there is no BT resistance reported, or even close to saying that in Asia. It's all on the other side of the world. Just just so that we are we are aware of it and be clear on that. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you. That's good. Um, here we go. What needs to be done to get universal mode of action labeling in the region? Uh, that's, that's pertaining to insecticide. So uh, mode of action labeling is based on the grouping that's, uh, uh, that's kind of done by IRAC and CropLife. And, and it's, it's universal. And, and it is more to the countries in each of the regions or, or in a continent to approve a mandatory labeling or a voluntary labeling. So in ASEAN, as on date, uh, I believe Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, if I'm not wrong, Vietnam, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but these are the countries which have some uh, mandatory labeling that kind of is uh, operating now. Uh, other countries are voluntary labeling or there is no answer to that, uh, but it's more driven based on the country regulations but the universal grouping and mode of action labeling is already there for insecticides, fungicides, and even herbicides now. Okay. Here's a question here around um, is, oh, sorry, is how uh, pesticide cocktails or mixtures practiced are quite common 
I'm not sure it doesn't quite make sense by farmers. How do these pesticide cocktails or mixtures practiced uh, by farmers and which seems to be quite common affect resistance management? That's an excellent question. Uh, cocktails means there can be one. Mixtures are generally, you know, uh, if they are legally approved mixtures, that's a different context altogether. Uh, but if, it, if you are talking about illegal products, yes, they bear a lot of impact on resistance management because we, we are entering into an area which is unknown. We don't know what that cocktail has. We don't know what that mixture has. And that would become very critical, uh, uh, you know, when we look into overall management in an area. And, 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 and if you're monitoring for one insecticide, whereas a cocktail has two, three other, which would impact the insect in a minor way or a major way, then we wouldn't be knowing it. So it's, okay. it's very complicated. Cocktails and mixtures, that's one of the reasons you don't encourage immediately, uh, by, uh, particularly at the illegal products level. Yeah, no, definitely. Difficult. I think that's very good advice. Um, a question here around, can, can you mix uh, or, or use rotate, I guess, uh, biopesticides and conventional pesticides uh, in, as part of a resistance management plan? Absolutely. If they have value, why not? So it's, it's just that, uh, you know, most biopesticides, uh, you need to look at their stability and how long their efficacy or residual action, we call it. And, and definitely should be using it. Uh, the only thing is if you're mixing it, please check your label recommendations and compatibility recommendations if there are any. So some, at times the insecticide may impact a biopesticide. So please check okay. for your for the recommendations of the product. Great. Particularly the, bio, particularly the biopesticide side, not the conventional pesticide, you know? Okay. Couple yeah. more questions here. You seem to advocate clean weeding, or I guess cleaning up residue that was left uh, around the crop as an important fall armyworm management tactic. Doesn't this go contrary to the promotion of natural enemies? That that's a good question. So it, it's a, it's a choice. It's a choice, or how do I say, a balance between what do you do at the beginning of the season? For weed management perspective, you don't keep on spraying herbicides to just kill the weeds anytime they come up. But at least it's a balance between what you want as a weed management perspective, but crop stubble destruction is a recommended practice in many places. And I don't think natural enemies dwell on, uh, you know, in crop destroyed or how do I say crop stubble that's left uh, in, in, the, in a field. And, and that's very important for you to consider that, that uh, probably there will be more fall army on in it than the natural enemies. Excellent. And yeah. I guess just, just before we go, I think um, Chris is, uh, is having a question here. It was actually quite similar to the alternating the pesticide mode of actions um, by inserting biological control into uh, IRM schemes. Um, hence, shouldn't conservation and augmentation biological control become core components of insecticide resistance management against fall armyworm? That's, that's a question. Well, Chris, good question as always. And, and uh, like, I, like I mentioned, any, any, any tools from the toolbox which would help sustain a product is always good. And, and if, if you're talking about ecological engineering kind of or uh, conservation kind of uh, uh, tools, once we understand them better in the Asian context where the agriculture is on commercial scale, uh, it's not a subsistence agriculture as we see, uh, like, like we see in some African countries or sub-Saharan Africa. Once we understand that if it's working, why shouldn't we include it always? Excellent. Yeah. Great. And um, I, there's some quite, there's a quite a few questions left in there for you, Srinivas, if you could answer them. And there's also one okay. from Wilma in the chat box. Wilma, if you could put them in the Q&A box, that would help. But it is very much around uh, seeking cooperation from the industry to make the event test strip available so we can verify whether the plant damaged is in a GM field or not. So I'll let you answer that in the Q&As in the chat, Srinivas, because we have to go to our next speaker. But thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, as no, always, sure. uh, excellent and lots of information and also practical advice. So it's, it's perfect. So thank you very much, Srinivas. Thanks, Alison. And I'd now